Since diabetes, and more importantly, prediabetes, is the major cause of plaque and inflammation, it's the by far the major cause of heart attack, stroke, blindness, kidney disease, all those bad things that are associated with chronic disease. And a lot of folks don't know that. That's one of the key goals of this channel is to make people aware. 90% of the people that have prediabetes aren't even aware of it. So a couple of people have already responded saying, oh, this is an interesting topic. And again, as often happens, I learn a lot of stuff. I learn about a lot of things from you guys. I think it was Bob Bell, one of our viewers that sent me this. It sent me several other things as well. This again is a, a study that appeared in a, a journal called Cell Reports. It's a fairly deep scientific journal. Again, deep scientific title, but we won't get too deep into that. Dysfunction of persisting beta cells is a key feature of early type 2 diabetes pathogenesis. What does that mean? Here's the bottom line. Here's what they did. They happened to be in the belly of a lot of surgical patients for other reasons. They had a mechanism and the patients gave prior agreement. They took some patients that had normal metabolism, some that had full-blown type 2 diabetes, and some that had prediabetes. They took tiny biopsies out of the pancreas and the beta cells to look at those beta cells and find out just what's going on. Are you losing beta cell function or are the beta cells actually going away? In other words, going back to that question of you can quote, grow your beta cells back. Again, this for a spoiler, I'll say, look, this would indicate what many of us have thought for a long time. It tends to provide a lot of evidence, a lot of proof that you don't lose those beta cells and they're not shrinking. They're not getting attacked. They're not being lost. The size is still there. Now, let me clarify. This is type 2 diabetes. Many of us know type 1 diabetes is a whole different mechanism. It tends to happen with very young people whereas type 2 diabetes mostly hits us baby boomers. With type 2 diabetes, the original problem is our receptors for insulin in our cell wall get rusty. They begin to become resistant to insulin. So our beta cells, you can get my nonverbals here. So the beta cells are having to push out more insulin to get those faulty, rusty, dysfunctional insulin receptors in the cell walls to work. With type 1 diabetes, it appears to be, for the most part, immune activities. Inflammation actually hitting the beta cells themselves, usually cross-reaction with something else, a foreign body. Won't go into that any deeper into that. We'll talk a little bit more about the study itself. Type 2 diabetes is a metabolic disorder responsible for long-term complications, decreased quality of life, and premature death. Type 2 diabetes is characterized by insulin resistance and insufficient insulin release from pancreatic islet beta cells. To correct inadequate insulin levels, effective therapies target the correct mechanism. In other words, why is this important? It's still debated whether insulin insufficiency is the result of compromised beta cell function. In other words, the amount of insulin released by each individual beta cell or reduced beta cell mass. In other words, the number of beta cells within the pancreas have decreased or a combination of both. And again, I'll keep giving you spoilers. It was the first one. It's not a, the second one and it's not a combination of both, at least according to this study. And again, I think this study makes a heck of a lot of sense once you get deeper into managing folks with prediabetes. So prior to this study, their point was, it's unclear whether the objective of type 2 diabetes prevention and therapy should be to protect and restore beta cell function or to prevent the death of beta cells and increase their mass. That was the study question. Researchers used pancreas tissue slices from metabolically phenotyped surgical patients. What does that mean? I told you that they took three groups of patients before the surgery some were prediabetic, some were diabetic, and some had neither problem. 
So that's what they mean by metabolically phenotyped. It's a, again, $2 words for a 50 cent description. Phenotype means what's their body function. So they found out what was going on with these folks and then they did the biopsies. Surgical samples were the following, four from non-diabetics, four from folks that had impaired glucose tolerance, IGT as you'll see in some of these images, and six from folks that had type two diabetes. Subjects were part of a larger cohort of 61 people with no diabetes, 71 with impaired glucose tolerance, and 88 with type two diabetes. Prior to surgery, subjects were phenotyped based on hemoglobin A1C, fasting glucose, and these guys were smart enough to do an OGTT, oral glucose tolerance test, and looking at ADA guidelines. Viable tissue slices were subsequently used with, a, again, another technical term, 3D morphometric analysis. As usual with these big words, just break it down. Morpho means your body shape and metrics means your measurement. So it's measurement of the shape of these beta cells. That's what that meant. And they looked at kinetic insulin secretion as well. To quantify the endocrine cell content, beta, alpha, and gamma cells, the researchers used this 3D morphometry. In other words, that's how they were able to tell what type of cell is this? Is this the exocrine pancreas cell? Exocrine means those are the, the cells that create enzymes for digestion. Or was this the endocrine cells, which were the beta cells, which we're focused on here. In non-diabetics, endocrine cells constitute about 48% or plus or minus 0.09%. Let me clarify something. 0.48%. So about half of a percent of the pancreas volume. The distinct endocrine cell volume fractions of endocrine cells were not significantly altered in the pancreas of non-diabetics, impaired glucose tolerance, and type 2 diabetics. In other words, what they're saying is, you look at these graphs and you look at the size and the portion of the mass of cells made up by the insulin cells, the beta cells, they were the same whether it was diabetic, non-diabetic, or pre-diabetic. Neither the distribution or of endocrine object size nor their contribution to the total uh, volume was significantly changed. Thus, the 3D morphometry revealed no difference. In other words, we're not losing the cells themselves. We're losing the function. So speaking of function, that's what they did in the next series. To address the beta cell function, researchers measured insulin secretion. Now you see that in this over here. Let me go through what they found and then we'll talk for a minute about this activity. In the non-diabetic, pancreas tissue slices showed a typical, you know, the biphasic insulin secretory pattern. In other words, secretion of that stored insulin and then later on secretion of the insulin that it made. Remember we were talking about that earlier. And we were talking about people with impaired glucose tolerance, prediabetes, usually lose that stored insulin function. They looked at it on these cells when they took these cells out of the pancreas, and that's was what was happening with the cells. In other words, they were depleted. In impaired glucose tolerance, samples showed a significantly increased basal insulin secretion. In other words, it's what we see with an oral glucose tolerance test these beta cells are working overtime. They're not getting a rest. They're continuing to push out more insulin than a non-diabetic during basal periods when we're fasting, when we're asleep. Somebody with prediabetes, their beta cells are continuing to push that insulin out because that insulin's not working. Why is the insulin not working? Because those insulin receptors are resistant. That hopefully helps you connect some dots. So in the type two diabetes, the baseline insulin secretion was similar to that of the non-diabetic. In other words, nice low secretion. It was significantly lower than somebody with impaired glucose tolerance. And again, that's what we tend to see as well, especially with people. What happens is as your beta cells are continuing to try to manage that glucose, they have to put out more during basal periods, during fasting periods, they get worn out they're not able to store any for that first phase and again as you continue to go into full-blown diabetes 
you start to get depletion and fatigue of that beta cell. It's no longer making, it can't respond to the first part. And then when it gets deeper, it can't respond even to the second part. That gets into that discussion about the five stages of diabetes. Both impaired glucose tolerance and type two diabetes patients lack the typical first phase peak prior to the second phase plateau. You see some of that here. Again, it's a little bit difficult to tell from this, but what you see is, look, the green, you see that early storage phase, that first phase, and then you get to 75 minutes and you get that second phase where the beta cells are making insulin. With the blue, the impaired glucose tolerance patients, you see they're pushing along making insulin even when they're supposed to be at rest. So therefore, once you get to that first phase, they don't have quite as much there. They're tired, they haven't been able to store insulin. Then they're still able though to get a little bit of a bump in that second phase at 75 to 80 minutes. This full-blown type two diabetic is down in the orange. As you see, the beta cell is depleted, it's worn out. It's not producing more during basal periods. At that point, this is a diabetic, remember, that person still has high blood sugars. The beta cell is just not able to respond to it. There's depletion, so there's no ability to respond to that first phase and then very minimal response even at the second phase. So you see what you've got there is that what Joseph Kraft would call us, and many others would call a stage five insulin penic, insulinopenic patient, type two diabetes patient, a patient who just doesn't have insulin anymore to put out. So to go back to the summary, this helps us in terms of the image. Let me read through again the text components. Beta cell mass and tissue slices appears intact throughout the progression from no diabetes to prediabetes to type two. In other words, the cells are still there. In pre-diabetics, impaired glucose tolerant donor tissue, the beta cell volume is unchanged, but beta cell function is significantly deteriorating, exhibiting increased basal release, in other words, fasting release, but loss of that first phase insulin secretion. In individuals with type two diabetes, function within the sustained beta cell volume still further declines. This means that beta cell dysfunction develops early in prediabetes and deteriorates further in type two diabetes. These results indicate that the dysfunction of persisting beta cells is the key factor, not the loss of mass, not the loss of the cells themselves. So as you begin to look through this, what you begin to see is again, a good visual. Impaired glucose tolerance, they have again, normal glucose, but it's taking a lot more insulin to make that happen. So you get glucose values that are not that elevated, but a lot of basal insulin to keep it down. Then that first phase, you've lost your insulin. You are not able to create a first phase. Second phase and beta cell mass are still retained in these prediabetics. Once you get into those deeper stages of diabetes, blood sugar's high, basal insulin has been depleted, there's none of it for the first phase or second phase, but you still have that beta cell mass. There's a lot of promise in that because theoretically it should be easier to restore function than it is to recreate new beta cells. So again, got a little bit deep. A couple of our folks on our team got a little bit confused as we went through some of this. I hope that I didn't butcher that up too much. Why wait for a disease and hope for a cure? I used to be an ER doc. My name is Ford Brewer. I quit ER after a few years because it was just so frustrating. Most of the things bringing people into the ER are things that should have been prevented, including heart attack, stroke, number one cause of death, number one cause of permanent disability. People think that you're just going to have those and that they're not predictable. Both of those are wrong. You, they are predictable and you don't have to have them. Usually it's lifestyle. Lifestyle is more important than supplements and even prescription drugs and even stents and surgery. 
But the current times are tough. Major financial impact with the lockdowns that most states have been going through. We've been working on a way to make this much more affordable with a subscription process. And that's exactly what we're announcing today. We've got two levels. One is the silver membership, where you get access to our courses, a private webinar each month, and access to our supplement store and supplement recommendations and prescription. Or I would suggest even more so the gold membership. You can get a script for a Freestyle Libre and find out what your blood sugar metabolism is doing on a daily basis. And you can get a lab order for inflammation, OGTT, and insulin survey. You can also get a 30-minute one-on-one with me. So I'm looking forward to seeing you. Cost is no longer an excuse. So if you're interested, go to go.prevmedheartrest.com slash prevmed subscription or call us at 859-721-1414, 859-721-1414 or email us at myhealth at prevmedheartrest.com. Looking forward to seeing you. Thank you.